Welcome everybody once again with our new weekly webinars. And my name is Barry Kassab and I'm an MCA market development from Shure. Today's webinar is gonna be uh, talking about the uh, controversial part about the microphones price. They, why are there $2,000 microphones or more or around that figure? But the point is, why are there microphones that are affordable, let's say. You can buy microphones as low as $10, but there are microphones that are as expensive as $4,000 or even $5,000 sometimes. So the question here is, what is the difference? And uh, this is a question that a lot of the uh, entry and intermediate musicians and engineers love to know about. I was one of those people who would never knew what the difference is until I started to go under the hood and you know uh, understanding it from from the schematic point of view as an electronic engineer myself, but also understanding it from a artistic perspective, which is between engineering and musicality as well. Now, a lot of that as well is coming back to the point that many of the famous microphones made it on records. So, uh, I can give an example that is so related, which is this microphone, the SM7B, for example, here. It's a microphone that was on Michael Jackson Thriller. So this microphone built up a lot of fame today because of its presence in a record label. Another example would be, of course, the Shure SM58, the Shure SM57, the Beta 58, the Shure 565 and 545, all these microphones, they made a success story on record labels, on, on, on previous artists. So that already builds a big hype around these microphones. So people already have those in demand to, to get the same sound of that particular record that they heard. So when people, let's say guitarists, talk about a certain tone on a certain record and how can they replicate that tone, the first thing that comes on that list is of course the guitar, the guitar type pickups, the amplifier that was used in that record, uh, probably some uh, guitar effects as well if that was there, and then the microphones used to record that sound. So um, these, these are a lot of ingredients that goes into the formula of giving the, the value of certain microphones. But also certain microphones were were uh, built in early days in certain technologies as well and certain precision that also gave the microphones a lot of their price points. So there are certain microphones that were built by watchmakers and the attention to details that time was the same kind of attention to details that was given to watches, especially those that were built in Switzerland, for example. Uh, certain uh, microphones as well contains tubes. And to get high-end tubes that are built to proper specifications, they are also, uh, they are also gaining up some value. Now, uh, going, up, going back again on the webinar today is like, what are we gonna address primarily? is first of all on how can we read microphone specifications how are we able to differentiate between a entry-level microphone and intermediate or even expensive ones and of course the price point goes up with the more details of that microphone that it's being in the specs specifications there so i can name a few of them which is sensitivity a dynamic range signal to noise ratio in some some cases and the uh, the other thing is, which are relative to those factors, but let's say hidden, not hidden because they don't want you to read it, because usually scientifically it's already there. So when I give you the dynamic range of a microphone, that already includes the self noise of the microphone. So we need to discuss as, as well what is the self noise and what is noise. And why is it there? And we need to also address a few things related to the way our ears are built, 
or made uh, to be given also ways to read specifications of my microphones. So when we say an A weighted, uh, let's say a specification of microphone, what does that mean versus the standard or flat? So to start with this, I'm going to start with, first with talking about the self noise. Now, self noise is something that exists mostly or primarily in condenser microphones. Now, does that mean that the dynamic microphones doesn't have self noise? It does, but it's so little that it's not even not even it's so negligible that it's not even um, significant anymore. But noise that is significant is usually generated by uh, electrical circuits. So most of the condenser microphones, they would have a circuitry inside. And uh, the circuit inside the, the microphone, I'll, I'll try to share my screen just to show, for example, a, a side cut of the, uh, the 44. So let me just share my screen. OK. So here we have the KSM44. So that is a condenser microphone, obviously. So this is the, the capsule. And then inside here, you can see that this is the preamp. This is the circuit that is made to amplify the signal of the cartridge or the capsule. Now, because there's an electronic circuit inside, that means there is no electronic circuit in the world that generates zero noise. It's impossible. <clears throat> so that means the microphone, when there is no signal, even on the, on the capsule, the circuit is generating a very little amount of noise. Now, KSM44, by the way, has one of the quietest preamps in the market. The self noise is very, very, very little. It's down to less than uh, three decibels. So that is a very, very low self noise for microphones like this. Now, the that means the circuit is generating just that little bit of animal noise. And that means the dynamic range is quite high on this microphone because this is able also to handle high SPL. So whenever a microphone generates an amount of self noise and can handle an amount of sound pressure level before distortion, this one minus the self noise is the dynamic range. OK, now uh, the reason why electronic circuits generate noise, the, it's it's inherited thing is that the components inside would need a threshold of operation, which we call the bias. And the bias, that means there is a bout of leakage in the circuit to make it work. So the the way it's cascaded inside stage after another, each one will generate a significant amount of noise, which create, creates a total amount of noise of the, to the microphones. Now, generally, expensive microphones have the lowest amount of self noise. And this is one of the main things that, I'll stop sharing my screen. One of the main things that contributes in building out the price point of the microphone. Because to be able to design a circuit, that is very low in amount of noise and able to generate the amount of output to the microphone, it's quite challenging. Now, when I say quite challenging, it doesn't mean that it's impossible, but it requires an amount of R&D. Now, the same thing goes into preamps in general. If you have a home studio, you want to get a, a preamplifier for your recording, you can always get away by buying a, any any audio interface. So when you buy an audio interface, uh, let's say at a budget price, you don't expect to get the widest dynamic range number one. You don't expect to get the widest or the, the most transparent translation of the analog signal into a digital signal. And moreover, you don't expect to get the the most transparency in general from these inputs. But if you use that same interface 
with an external preamp that is a more high quality or it's like more investment done into it. There are plenty of preamps that you can research in the market. Some of them can reach to really big numbers. You uh, you, you can spend easily six to $8,000 only on a couple of channels of preamps. Now, when do you need that? Of course, that is a question, but regardless of the application you need these preamps for, if you are in a very, very, very quiet room, these preamps has a very, very minimal amount of noise because already your mic has a very minimum amount of noise and your preamp then adds more amount of noise on it. So you want to have the lowest amount of noise in the total outcome. To give an example of this, for those who uh, remember the tape machines or the tape cassettes, uh, they were quite famous in the 80s and 90s, uh, like mid 90s. So one of the selling points for me to move into CD players was the background noise. So the transparency you were hearing on CDs compared to cassettes back in the days was amazing. Cassettes had inherited noise. The amount of noise was already way too high compared to CDs, even compared to MP3s today. I'll give you an example. If you're listening on, on music on your phone right now, when the song finishes or when you stop your phone from playing, is there any amount of noise you hear in your headphones or in your earphones? Do you hear any kind of hissing in the background? No. If you really focus and your, your earphones are the kind of isolating earphones or even the noise canceling ones, you only hear the ambience. But if you get some different kind of earphones, what we call them the noise isolation, which is the same ones that we use in Shure, for example. The noise isolation earphones, they, they plug your ears completely. They sit inside your ear canal. So when the music stops, you hear absolutely nothing. Like not even the ambience, because actually it blocks the ambience. But, you know, that kind of experience was something that you would impossible to replicate when you had cassettes. The idea that the cassette preamp itself generates a, an amount of noise is singing in the background. So whenever you put the, 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 the cassette machine on, even before you hit play, just powering it on and you plug in your headphones in, there's that, the background. And then when you hit play with the tape actually moving on the heads, there's another amount of hiss added on the top. So to kind of replicate that, you know, you switch the cassette machine on, it goes like, and when you put the play on, it like, it becomes more like a brown noise. So the first time I heard the CD player, I was blown by the, 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 the clarity I was hearing. Like when you power it on, you hear nothing. When you hit play on the CD player, you only hear nothing again. And then suddenly this song starts. It's like, you know, it's literally sitting in the space. So the clarity I was hearing that time was amazing. Now going back into preamps, the, the intermediate and expensive microphones, they make sure in the quality control and in the manufacturing that they have the lowest amount of noise possible out of the microphone. So that means when you plug in the microphone into your mixer or in your preamp, there is nothing coming out of it that you can significantly hear or that can significantly affect your recording. Now I've seen some microphone shootouts for budget microphones that were made, you know, for hobbyists or even let's say the $10 kind of microphones or $20 microphones. Uh, and I've seen comparisons between these and entry-level microphones from known manufacturers. And there is a noticeable difference between the hiss between the two microphones. So I'm talking about entry-level microphones from known manufacturers versus a random budget microphone uh, amount of noise. And you can right away tell the difference. Now, would that affect your uh, performance if you're just trying to learn performing vocals or recording from the microphone? Of course not, but when you try to record then quiet sources, this is where it makes a difference. So imagine if somebody's trying to call you from a crowd in a restaurant. So you're in a restaurant, 
the restaurant, you know, people are chatting already, and somebody's trying to call you from a far distance at the same level of noise in the in the ambience, will you be able to hear them? Of course not. He needs to yell. And of course, your experience in a crowded restaurant, like for example, in a um, uh, in a food court, like in a mall, when you go to the food court, one of the main things that is not comfortable there, the amount of noise, versus when you go to a more expensive restaurant that has a, a cozy environment and a quiet atmosphere. And the main difference in, in a meal from a food court versus in a better restaurant is the atmosphere. But in the atmosphere, you can actually have a conversation with your girlfriend, for example, or your wife or your friend at a comfortable level. But when you go to a food court, most of the conversation is yelling because you need to overpower the atmosphere. And that is the same thing is that when you get a microphone with a loud self noise, that means the ability to capture quiet sources is not gonna be efficient. So that means you need to then invest into a higher grade microphone. Now, the, the main difference, for example, between some of our series, let's say the PG Alta series and the, the studio microphones, a good example would be a PG A27 versus the SM27. What would be the difference between these two? Right away, I would tell you, number one, self noise. Number two, the dynamic range. The dynamic range on the PG Alta is not the same as the SM27, and the PG Alta self noise 27 versus the SM27 is not the same. Now, does that mean the PG Alta is not a good microphone for quiet sources? One thing that Shure makes certain of is that even our entry-level microphones from the PG Alta are already superior to plenty of entry-level microphones out there in the market. <clears throat> and that's where the word Alta is coming from. It's like it's from the, the, uh, the, the ultimate or like an ultimate entry-level. So um, for those who attended my uh, workshop with the drums a couple of weeks ago, I recorded the, the toms using the PG Alta microphones. So the PG Alta are actually very decent for many uh, home studio applications. But of course they would not be very good when it comes to touring, number one. But that means the durability is not the same as a studio microphones, the SM series. And the other thing is, if you are in a very, very quiet booth. So if you are in a proper studio that, it's, that has a booth that is built with noise levels, in the level of 30 decibels SPL. So for example, the booth that I built inside here in my room, I made sure I would not exceed the level of 35 decibels uh, noise level SPL inside. So when I use certain microphones inside, I can actually hear the noise level on these microphones versus when I use intermediate or even advanced level microphones. And if you're trying to record uh, sounds like uh, flutes, shakers. Uh, you want to get the 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 maximum amount of details, like you know the wind blows, the even the the movement of the fingers in the in the uh, in the flute. You need you need a you need a good microphone. So entry level microphones might not be good if you want to give a certain proximity. Now. Also, it's quite known in studios that close distant mic micing would not give you the whole soul of the instrument. So for example, if I'm trying to mic up a violin, I would not be able to get the whole sound of the violin if I'm very, very close to the violin. So usually I need to step away from the violin to get more of the life and, and the feel of the instrument. But if I'm in a, in a normal room, I would get the room ambience, which will disturb the instrument. So I need to have the whole player in a very, very quiet room or in a studio room where the noise level is extremely minimal. And then I can actually start to distance the mic from the instrument and get the soul, and the feel of the instrument. But that implies two things. First, to have a very quiet room, which is very hard to have in a house that is not built with a proper booth. Second thing is, 
when you start distancing the mic from the source, you need the mic to be more sensitive, which usually entry-level microphones would not give you the same way that intermediate and advanced or expensive microphones would do. So uh, when people ask me, is like, why do I need a KSM microphone in certain uh, applications versus I can get away with SM or even PG Alta in certain uh, occasions is the same reason. So if I'm trying to mic up a jazz drummer who's playing with brushes, I would tend to step away from PG Alta and start using the SM series or even the Beta and KSM series. But if I'm using a rock or pop drummer who's hitting normally on the kit, then it'll be more forgiving to use PG Alta. Now, if I'm in a room that I want to get even captured the room details, if you remember when you talked about the natural room reverbs, like you know the Abbey, Stu Abbey Road Studios that actually sells rights to the rooms, to plug-in companies, something I've learned yesterday, um, and some other you know uh, studios in Texas and then in California, so certain rooms that were built to have a kind of reflection, a kind of a live feel to them. So these rooms, to capture the, 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 the maximum details of these rooms, you start to need to consider uh, high-end microphones. And when you say high-end microphones as well, that means also high-end preamps and high-end gear. And the whole investment right away jumps up to be in multiplica multiplications of thousands of dollars, starting from the microphone onwards. Now, there are also other examples of microphones that are built with certain durability and ability to withstand uh, the harshest environments. A good example to this is our ribbon mics. This is an example here. Uh, this falls into the range of a $2,000 microphone, about $2,600. Um, now, this microphone is not a condenser microphone, though it looks like one. This is a ribbon microphone. But ribbon microphones are known to be extremely sensitive, like extremely sensitive to the way that you need to really handle this like a diamond. If you drop it, it malfunctions, it breaks. If you put it in front of a source that is loud, it might destroy it. If you accidentally apply a phantom power to it, you will destroy it. And this is known across many, many, many ribbon microphones in the market. Now, Shure was one of the first to introduce a ribbon microphone that can actually stand a lot of beating. So the material that they use the conductor inside, the ribbon conductor, is called, uh, it's made of a, a material called rosewellite. Uh, it's a material that does not break easily, though it retains the same light, uh, feel, and flexibility of previous material. I think previously they used either aluminum or uh, magnesium in the ribbon mics, but those were easily destroyed. And people who got microphones from other manufacturers that they were built like this, they always handled them with care. I've seen engineers who take these microphones in their own baggage, hand baggage on the airplanes, just for the chance that they would load their bags on the airplane on and off, and they might drop it. That might cause the uh, mics to get destroyed. So uh, that is another example that you know certain builds and attention to details and builds can hike up the price of the microphones. Uh, also, the Another example that we can give here, which is the KSM44, which I shared the picture of. The material that they use in building the, uh, the diaphragm and the, the capsule is quite unique. So they, they, uh, they were able to get a very wide dynamic range from the material that is used in the, uh, in the capsule on these microphones, plus that the preamps on the KSM series in general are extremely quiet. They're like one of the quietest preamps in the market. Uh, sure, we're known to build uh, the early days broadcast uh, uh, field recorders, let's say. So one of their field recorders was known, the, the 
from the FP series, the FP31, 32, 33, those were also known to be very low uh, self noise. So if anybody is interested to read about the Shure uh, outboard mixers, you would notice that they are very low noise. And a lot of that technology was brought into the KSM series later on. Now, uh, there is a short video that I'd like to share with you. It will summarize some of the things that I've said, including the electrical characteristics of microphones. So this will help you understand how to differentiate between microphones when you read the specifications. Now, I know maybe some of you are not really engineers, might be musicians or something like this, but still, if you try to focus on that video, it will start to give you an idea on how can you start to be able to tell why this microphone is worth that much versus another microphone that is slightly worth less and not to be fooled by only price points. Because unfortunately, the price point does not always uh, differentiate a microphone from another one. So I cannot usually uh, tell the difference between a ribbon microphone and a condenser microphone. The price point here is not only about the quality of the circuitry here anymore. It's also there is stuff related to the build and also there's stuff related to heritage. But if I'm comparing two condenser microphones, then the video that I'm going to share right now is going to be very relevant to this. So um, this uh, video is actually available on YouTube, but I'd like to share it here. Uh, and it's a part of four parts related to microphones. So if you are interested to look these up, just look for microphone specifications or uh, let's say understanding microphones on uh, the Shure channel on YouTube. So uh, you can understand a lot of the other webinars that I did, but this specific video is going to talk about what we're handling up, uh, about today. So be ready for this. Let's go. When choosing a microphone, you need to consider the sound source and the equipment that the microphone will connect to. In other words, the mic needs to be compatible with both the acoustic characteristics of what you're miking and the electrical characteristics of the sound system or recorder that you're using. If it isn't, you might have problems with noise, low level, or no audio at all. The specifications that relate to connectivity are collectively known as the microphone's electrical output. The sensitivity or output level of a microphone is defined as the voltage of its output signal when it is exposed to a certain sound level. A more sensitive mic puts out a higher voltage than a less sensitive mic, assuming that the incoming sound level is the same. A more sensitive mic can pick up quieter or more distant sound sources, while a less sensitive mic usually works better for loud or close sound sources. If you try to use a less sensitive microphone on a quiet source, you'll need to turn up the level on your mixer or audio interface to compensate. Depending on how quiet your equipment is, this may create hiss. Listen to the difference as we record a person speaking as they might when recording a podcast. Here's the more sensitive mic. He wrote down a long list of items. Now here's the less sensitive mic. A siege will crack the strong defense. The sensitivity of a microphone can be specified as a voltage or in decibels above or below one volt. Because microphone signals are typically less than one volt, the decibel figure is a negative number. A higher number means the microphone is more sensitive, while a lower number means the mic is less sensitive. The sensitivity specification is meaningless unless you know what sound pressure level, or SPL, the mic was exposed to when it was measured. Most microphones are tested at a sound pressure level of 94 decibels, also known as 1 pascal. You might see either notation, but they mean the same thing. The impedance of the microphone is important because it affects how it interfaces with the next device in the audio chain and its ability to be used with long cables. A low impedance mic, with an impedance of less than 600 ohms, can be used with cable lengths of 1,000 feet or more with no loss of sound quality. 
For this reason, professional microphones always have low impedance. A high impedance mic, with an impedance of more than about 10,000 ohms, should not be used with microphone cables longer than 20 feet. With longer cables, the sound can become dull or muffled. A microphone's wiring configuration affects the signal's tendency to pick up electrical noise or hum as it passes through the cable. A microphone can be configured with either a balanced or an unbalanced output. A microphone is said to have a balanced output when the signal is carried on two conductors with a separate connection to the metallic shield inside the mic cable. The signal on each conductor is the same level but opposite polarity. When connected to a balanced input on a sound system or recorder, this configuration is very effective at rejecting electrical noise and hum and is essential for longer cable runs. An unbalanced microphone output carries its signal on just one conductor with a separate connection to the metallic shield inside the mic cable. An unbalanced connection is not very effective at resisting electrical noise and hum, so unbalanced microphones are typically used only with shorter cable runs. However, most modern professional microphones have balanced outputs, so as long as you're connecting to a device with balanced inputs, this is not an issue. The most common connector used for balanced configurations is the XLR type. A three-pin male version is used for outputs, while a three-socket female version is used for inputs. There are some specifications that only apply to condenser microphones because they relate to the electrical circuitry that is part of a condenser mic. The circuitry inside a condenser microphone generates a small amount of hiss, which is called self-noise. It's specified in decibels, and the lower the number, the quieter the mic is. Low self-noise is especially important if you're recording quiet voices or instruments, or the mic will be located relatively far from the source. The maximum SPL is the loudest sound that a condenser mic can handle without overloading the internal electronics and causing distortion. This is important if you will be positioning the mic close to a loud source, such as a guitar amp or drum. Some condenser mics include a switchable attenuator or pad that reduces its sensitivity. This extends the microphone's ability to handle very loud sounds without distortion. Most pads allow the mic to tolerate sounds that are 10 to 20 dB louder. The difference between the maximum SPL and the self noise is called the dynamic range of the mic. This is essentially the range of sound levels that the microphone can work with. A wider dynamic range lets you use the mic in a wider variety of conditions. Most condenser microphones are powered by phantom power from the mixer or recorder. The required voltage and current consumption will tell you if the microphone will work with the inputs on your mixer or recorder. Phantom power is a DC voltage, usually between 12 and 48 volts. Some condenser microphones can operate on a wide range of phantom voltages, while others require exactly 48 volts. Make sure that your mixer or recorder can supply the voltage that your condenser mic needs. The microphone's electrical output gives you a better understanding of its capabilities and how it will work with your equipment. By understanding microphone characteristics like electrical output, you'll be able to choose the best mic for any application and get better results when recording or using a sound system. For more information about microphone specifications, visit Shure.com. Hope that was uh, helpful. So there were a few uh, things that were mentioned here that I'm gonna carry on with the uh, webinar today, which is the uh, the noise in the room, which is the AC noise. So you noticed when they talked about the balanced cables and the unbalanced cables that one can reject the noise and the other one will not. But also the way the microphones are built also can be made to be able to reject noise in addition to the cable rejecting the noise. So certain microphones, they have something they call them the humbucking cable, the humbucking coil, sorry. The humbucking coil in a microphone is an extra windings inside the microphone that are made to subtract 
the noise gathered by the primary coil of the microphone. So if you remember when you talked about the microphone's build, is that you know we have a diaphragm and you have the main coil stretched to it, suspended in a magnetic field. So that means if you're holding a microphone next to an AC source, let's say you have your keyboard, and inside the keyboard there's a transformer. So if you're having your microphone next to your keyboard and you want to sing while playing, there is some amount of electromagnetic field emitted from the transformer of your keyboard that can be picked up by the microphone. So when you use uh, entry-level microphones that does not have humbucking coils, the microphone will pick up the hum, and you can hear it really, uh, it, it, it'll be quite obvious. So you, you find yourself that you need to face the mic away from the keyboard or put it in a position that might not be comfortable to you. So mics that has humbucking coils in it are immune to this. SM7B, for example, has an, is known to have a humbucking coil around the cartridge. So the coils will be outside of the diaphragm. It has nothing to do with the diaphragm. So the diaphragm has its own motor, let's say they call it usually the coil or the diaphragm, they call it a motor. And then outside, there'll be an extra windings that goes in reverse. So whenever the mic is in a place where there is a emitted uh, sound from any reason because of the hardware in the room, you probably might have some neon lamps or your, ne your, your table lamp. All of those actually, they emit amount of noise that the microphone will also pick up. So expensive microphones do have humbucking coils in them. Another thing that differentiates expensive microphones from the entry-level microphones is the impedance matching. In the video, you notice they were talking about low impedance microphones and that low impedance microphones are able to use longer cables without any signal loss. So, uh, all the microphones, all professional microphones, starting from the SM series onwards, they do have built-in transformers or a built-in matching circuit that converts the high impedance preamplifiers into a low impedance. A good example to this is the SM81. If you ever be in touch with this microphone, you can actually read on the bottom here that it's a 150 ohms output. So it's even below 200 ohms. So that is a very low impedance microphone. Um, usually the maximum that microphones would reach to is 600 ohms impedance. So the higher the impedance, the more lossy the cable will be compared to the microphone. But anything below one kilo ohm for a microphone is already a low impedance in the world of uh, recording, let's say. But most of the dynamic microphones, they are in the range of 250 to 300 ohms, maximum 600 ohms. Now, the, the fact that you need to do an impedance matching, that means you need to also make sure that the, the conversion is not causing any loss in the, in the, or coloration in the signal. So uh, in the dynamic microphones, Shure uses transformers. As these transformers are known to be uh, very efficient and very consistent. So there is no discrepancy between any microphone. Every single microphone sounds the same as the other. And the transformer helps also in reducing the low frequency or the proximity effect to some extent. Now, uh, to handle the, uh, the other part, which is related to uh, the noise, cancellation in balanced and unbalanced. This is something quite known in, in electronics. So most of the preamps in the mixers or your interfaces, they will get the balanced uh, cable. The balanced cable is the three pin uh, kind of cable like those. So you have always three pins. So that means two pins are handling the signal and one of the pins is a reference. That reference is also connected to the, the metallic uh, cover of the plug. So that means the signal is traveling across the two conductors. So one of them is in a positive and the other one is in the negative. And then the third one is just zero. Now these conductors, they can pick up some noise from the equipment around you like an AC signal here. 
But the advantage of the interface, what it does, it only amplifies the difference. That means the difference between the two conductors. So we already know that one is positive and one is negative. So that means there is a difference between the positive and the negative. But you know the trick is the positive and the negative are carrying the same amount of noise with the same polarity. So if the noise on the first conductor is going up, the difference between them is zero. And if the noise is going down on the same conductors, the difference between them is zero. But the noise difference between one of the conductors and the reference is noticeable. So that means your interface will only amplify the difference. And this is what you want it to do. So that means the cable can be as long as you want without worrying about the noise. The moment you start using a jack, like something similar to this thing, you can see this only has two conductors. You have the shield and the tip or the, the, uh, the signal cable. So if that carries noise, there will be a difference between this one and the other one. And unfortunately, in that case, if the cable is longer than anticipated, you will actually hear noise. I'm 100% sure some of you who've uh, ever rigged uh, speakers and you use this kind of connections like a jack into the mixer and then the other part is an XLR or a jack that goes into the speaker, a powered speaker. You notice if the cable is longer than 10 meters, you start getting a bit of a buzz on the speaker. So when there is no signal, you hear the buzz in the speaker. And that is a perfect example on using a uh, an unbalanced or unbalanced cable with uh, with audio equipment. So that's why using balanced cable is quite uh, recommended all the time with, with audio equipment. Uh, the last point as well is grounding. This is extremely important. People use plugs that do not match the specs of the country you're in. So an example of uh, the country that I'm in is, is the United Arab Emirates or in Dubai. They use the English uh, type of plugs or they call it the 13 amp plug. So this one looks, you know, the three pins, but you have the third pin on the top and the two pins on the bottom. <clears throat> a lot of people use adapters. They buy an equipment and it comes with a two pin plug. The third one is a female. So it's like a round plug, which is like the Euro plug. And they neglect the fact that they need to use the third plug because they use the adapter and they plug it in and they find that their equipment works. Now it works with a time bomb. Time bomb is the moment you get these kind of cables like the jack, if this is plugged to your other piece of equipment that has a ground on it, a ground active, and the other one is not grounded, the moment the tip hits the jack, because the jack usually is made of metal as well, the moment that the tip hits the metal shield of that non-grounded piece of equipment, you destroy the grounded equipment. The reason is the metal shield, the casing of that non-grounded uh, equipment would be carrying a significant amount of voltage, not less than 85 volts, and it can reach up to 95 to 100 volts. Now, it's not going to electrocute you. You might feel a sting when you touch it sometimes or a bit of a buzz when you move your hand on top of it, like the fridge sometimes or like, you know, the cooker or the, the microwave. But that little amount of voltage is powerful enough to destroy your interface. So a lot of people who destroyed their recording interfaces or their guitar pedals or their headphone amplifiers because of either using adapters that are not grounded or one of your equipment is grounded and the other one is not is due to this. So I strongly recommend you to always use grounded plugs. If you get something that has a Euro plug and you're a country that doesn't use the Euro standard, cut the plug, replace it with the right plug. You can easily do that by going online and checking the, the color codes and you can just wire it yourself. It's one of the easy tasks that you can do. But that can save you a lot of money down the line because a lot of these equipments, when they get blown, the warranty will not cover it. Now, uh, this reaches to the end of today's webinar. Today's webinar is quite uh, short and sweet. 
uh, hope it was very informative to you. Uh, we have a Q&A uh, icon on the right side. Uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, if you have any. Uh, if you don't have any, um, then it will be the end of the webinar for today. So uh, before I end the webinar and giving, giving you time also to ask the questions, uh, I'd like to highlight that uh, these webinars are available on YouTube. You can find them on Shore Mia YouTube channel. I uh, I strongly recommend you guys to check our channel up. There's another uh, interesting uh, series that we are also showing on YouTube, which is the Shure sessions. The Shure sessions are in Arabic with an English translation. So those who do not speak Arabic, don't worry, you'll be able to read the translation. And you know, music has no language. So listening to the music and the way the microphones are positioned would give you a very big insight an informative insight on two things. First is we're using Arabic ethnic instruments. Secondly, it will give you an idea on how these microphones sound in a proper studio environment. So the Shure series are a very interesting series, properly shot, very well produced, with nice and crystal clear sound bites. So reach out to this channel, Shure Mia, on YouTube. Uh, please subscribe, like, even comment. Let us know what you think about those. If you have any ideas that you want us to share as well, you can reach out there and write your comments. Additionally, uh, I'm running a Instagram channel related to Shure, which is Barry underscore at underscore Shure. Uh, feel free and uh, follow my account. You can send me direct messages about anything that you'd like to learn about, and I'll be more than happy to share that in my live feeds on Instagram. So uh, this will be our webinar for today. Uh, since there are not no any questions, uh, I hope you have a wonderful day for today, and we'll see you soon in our next webinars. Until then, have a good one. See you soon.